investigate this person further so that they can actually see whether or not this person was actually the person that committed this crime, which of course, sometimes these investigations can be unwarranted, which kind of leads into some of the privacy concerns I already mentioned earlier. And then also, uh, a brief background into what standard operating procedures are. These are essentially the things that laboratories have set up so that uh, every member of their laboratory is ultimately doing the same thing. They're following the proper procedures so that evidence can go to court um, and ultimately that they're not screwing stuff up and stuff like that. So for the actual standard operating procedures, um, like I said, um, the FBI's CODIS system is ultimately what is used for familiar DNA searching and is also what is used for most DNA analysis cases here in the U.S., not just manual DNA searching. And so there, uh, the FBI is the one that is ultimately going to set the standard operating procedures at the federal level. And unfortunately, with familial DNA searching and forensic genetic genealogy, they actually do not have any true standard operating procedures. They have what are essentially recommendations for state laboratories or local laboratories so that they can choose what they want to do with familial DNA searching. But the FBI itself has not made a conclusive um, decision as to whether or not they feel like familial DNA searching or forensic genetic genealogy should be used. So diving into the state level, this is where the uh, individual states have more decision as to whether or not they want to use familial DNA searching or forensic genetic genealogy. And at the state level, there is currently about 12 states that have said, yes, we will allow the use of familial DNA searching. Um, Texas and California are the two largest states, and like I said, Previously, of course, you may have heard of the cases that came out of California that allowed the use of familial DNA searching in terms of genetic technology. Um, Texas, there hasn't been as many high-profile cases. Um, typically, it's going to be used to solve um, unsolved cold cases or in, uh, just a missing persons case. So, you may not have heard about those as much, but they are still being used here. Um, but when it comes to the actual standard operating procedures, um, most of the states have only small variations between each other. Um, typically, this is going to be they only want the use of familial DNA searching um, when there is a violent crime involved or a crime that has gone unsolved for a very long time. In that case, the laboratory will sign off to say, yes, it is okay to use familial DNA searching in this case, and they will go ahead and do that. But in regards to forensic genetic genealogy, no state currently has said yes. In fact, even California, that new state in the Golden State Killer case, it really hadn't been approved widely across the state. Um, and so that was ultimately kind of a pretty rare case. Um, on the other hand, in other countries, specifically the United Kingdom, it is a little bit different. They actually have um, decided to use familial DNA searching specifically. Um, they want to use it at the wide federal level, and they have okayed that. And they have actually been allowing these familial DNA searching since around 2008, 2009, and it has actually been very successful for them. Um, it is a great tool to be used for when there isn't any other tools available to investigators. It's like a last ditch effort, but it has been very successful, and the United Kingdom is a great example of how this can be used successfully at the federal level. And if the FBI here in the United States were ever to say yes, we will use this at the federal level, the UK would be a great um, lesson for them. So for the current uses, like I said, I'll go into a little bit more detail about the Golden State Killer and the Grim Sleeper. And so like I said, these were prolific serial killers in the state of California, and both of them, their cases went unsolved for decades. Um, the Golden State Killer was active for around um, three decades, and it took another two decades uh, to eventually put him in prison, and the Grim Sleeper also was um, active for about two decades, and as well went unnoticed for about another decade. And so with the Golden State Killer case, um, they used forensic genetic genealogy, and is actually one of the only few uses of forensic genetic genealogy across the world. In fact, I believe there's only about 70 cases in which forensic genetic genealogy has been used to solve a crime, and all 70 of those cases have come from the U.S. This is just the most well-known, so I will discuss this one. And with the Golden State Killer, of course, his DNA was not showing up in the CODIS system. Uh, 
and no possible relatives were showing up in the CODIS system, so investigators did not know where to look. And this is ultimately where they came up with the proposition of, hey, let's look at a genealogy website. There's much more information here. We can catch, uh, catch a much wider net um, and potentially find someone that is related to this potential suspect. And they did exactly that. They went into GED Match, which is essentially a accumulation of all the other um, accessory genealogy websites. And they were able to find a possible relative of the Golden State Killer. And eventually they said, okay, this guy, pretty strong suspect. He has a possible relative. It's matching to this DNA we found on one of the scenes of the Golden State Killer cases. And so they investigated him further. And of course, they eventually put him into prison. Grim Sleeper, of course, very similar, zero killer. They had his DNA, but it wasn't matching to the CODIS system. And so they ran it through CODIS to find a possible relative. And so they used familial DNA searching in this case, where they found a possible relative's DNA in the CODIS system, and eventually put him into prison as well. So for the pros and cons of familial DNA searching and forensic genealogy, um, this is a brief table kind of covering the basics for the differences here. Um, but to go into a little bit more specifics, um, familial DNA searching, like I said, uses STR typing. Um, this is technology that's already available for the scientists. They're already trained to use that kind of um, technology, so it is a much easier um, transfer of information for them. And so it is much easier to use familial DNA searching for your typical forensic DNA analyst. But with forensic genetic genealogy, they really don't have um, access to the technology, and they haven't been previously trained to use the SNP technology, which forensic genetic genealogy uses. And so oftentimes, they're going to have to send off the DNA they have to a third party. Um, typically, this is going to be your ancestry or your genealogy company. And of course, you're having to send it off to another company that's going to raise prices, and also, you're not going to have the same kind of like reviews and checks that you typically have in a forensic laboratory at these genealogy web, uh, website laboratories. And so a lot of problems arise with forensic genetic genealogy in that case. So the benefits of forensic genetic genealogy, of course, you're able to cast that much wider net, find more people in their system than you typically would with CODIS. But at the same time, there are a lot of cons, which is the reason why it has not been widely adopted within the United States or even in states in only about 70 cases. Familial DNA searching, though, like I said, it's much more adaptable. It uh, is easier to adopt, and it can essentially already be adopted now, which is why 12 states currently use it. And it's been used in around 450 to around 500 cases here in the US, and I believe around 700 cases in the United Kingdom. So it's already kind of seen a frequent use here, and I still think it will continue to see that success. So for the future uses of familial DNA searching and forensic genetic genealogy, this is where things kind of start to get a little murky because there are still a lot of concerns, specifically in uh, privacy concerns, about whether or not we should be using either of these techniques. Um, specifically here in the US, there are a lot of concerns with the Fourth Amendment. Um, about whether or not uh, using other people's DNA to find a criminal is a breach of that Fourth Amendment. Um, furthermore, there are concerns about how investigators are collecting this DNA. Um, and there's just many concerns specifically here in the US. Um, as you can see, this is a picture of 23andMe, who currently says that, no, we're not going to allow investigators to find your DNA on our website. But in reality, if they ever wanted to, they could simply get a warrant and find your information on there anyways. So even though you may feel protected, these genealogy websites still ultimately can give up your information. So there's also now concern about whether or not people should be including their DNA on these websites anyways. Um, but also, it's not just these genealogy websites. Um, the CODIS system, of course, includes DNA that has been taken from um, and so they are um, giving up their rights to their DNA because of the crimes they have committed. But at the same time, if you're going to be using that DNA to find a suspect that hasn't committed any crimes, um, there are concerns about um, unwarranted investigations of someone that may have not done anything 
involved. And so, like I said, the future uses of this technology is still very much murky because there is this very um, current and hot debate right now um, in the judicial system um, about whether or not this is even legal and whatnot. And so, like I said, familial DNA searching ultimately is much more accessible and can be um, included almost immediately. Um, and if these privacy concerns are disregarded or eventually there is a conclusion to these privacy concerns and people agree that ultimately we are doing this for the greater good, that I'm willing to be investigated in order to potentially find someone like the Golden State Killer who has committed many murders, then yes, I will be willing to do this. And so familial DNA searching, I think, in my opinion, that it will be um, adopted in the U.S. much more quickly. I think it will be, it be eventually adopted at the federal level. And for forensic genetic genealogy, I'm optimistic that I think it will eventually be adopted. But with forensic genetic genealogy, it is a much slower process. It's much newer, and there are a lot more concerns with it, um, specifically in the privacy of the So for my conclusion, um, ultimately I have talked about um, familial DNA searching and forensic genetic forensic genetic genealogy, um, their future and current uses, and the reason I did this today was ultimately to provide a little bit more information regarding these techniques because there is still not a lot known about these techniques. And specifically for familial DNA searching, these are great tools for investigators um, to solve crimes that have gone unnoticed or unsolved. And so, specifically in cases that have gone unsolved for so long, I think this is a great tool for people to use um, so that families can finally get the answers they've been wanting for years. And so, in my personal opinion, I do think these should be adopted. Um, and I do think eventually these privacy concerns may eventually be put on the back end. And I think people will come to understand that there are some things that we're willing to give up in order to solve some crimes. But at the same time, I don't think we should just completely disregard these privacy concerns privacy concerns, I think they are legitimate. I think, obviously, we don't want to have police come knocking on our door for something we didn't do simply because we're a possible relative of someone that we've maybe never even met. And so, I think there are some great arguments on, on either side, but I ultimately just wanted to provide some information regarding these um, techniques that you may eventually hear more about in the future, and I ultimately hope will be adopted. So these are my sources, and are there any questions? Before we do that, I'm going to invite Dr. Eric Fisher up to say a few words, and he'll take away from your soul and the court recommendation. You're welcome. So I'm really proud of Jack for completing his research and been working with me for the past year. He's been an integral part of the forensic department. As uh, some students in the room know, he does a lot of, a lot of blood work. Um, I appreciate your help. He's done a fantastic job in your research projects. And it's my privilege to give you your soul of the years. But there may be the similarity there, and 
so they may be seeing, oh, well, this maybe is a possible relative, and so you saw it maybe using the criminal DNA searching techniques in this case. Um, so that's why this technology is also beneficial in cases. So there's time for questions. Let's take one more. 